So it's a couple minutes after noon, and we'll probably want to be as punctual as possible. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce myself and our moderator for our session. My name is John Pfeffer, and I'm the Director of Foreign Policy and Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. I'm also the director of the Global Just Transition Project, which looks at the issue of clean energy transition uh, from the perspective of different countries, as well as at the multilateral level. And we've been holding a number of different sessions on uh, what this you know, transition to a fossil fuel free future, which is hard to say with all those Fs, a fossil fuel free future uh, looks like um, in different countries around the world, as well as at the multilateral level. And today we are going to look at the issue of trade. We have had sessions on global governance, on climate debt, and today the issue of trade. Um, I'm delighted to have our panelists here uh, presenting on this issue in both English and in Spanish, and we are working with the Eco-Social Pact of the South, Pacto Eco Social del Sur, on this, uh, this series of uh, events on the multilateral level. And I'd uh, like to introduce my colleague, um, Jen, uh, and uh, you know she is um, a fellow here at the uh, Institute for Policy Studies. And um, she is uh, uh, an associate fellow, I should say, uh, who has been researching, writing, and collaborating closely with the struggles of mining affected communities and allied organizations in Latin America, Canada, and other parts of the world. Um, and I've been delighted to work with Jen Moore for several years. So Jen, I'm going to pass it over to you and disappear into the cloud as this <laughs> continues. Thanks so much, John. And welcome, everyone. Bienvenidos, bienvenidas, bienvenides uh, to this webinar today. Um, just a, a quick reminder for those of you that are uh, just joining us, there will be simultaneous interpretation. Uh, from English to Spanish and Spanish to English, and we'll have presentations in both languages. So to access the interpretation, you can choose your preferred language um, by clicking on the interpretation globe at the bottom of your screen. Va a haber interpretación simultánea de inglés a español y español a inglés, y para acceder a la interpretación pueden hacer clic en el icono del globo en la parte inferior de su pantalla, para seleccionar el idioma que prefiere escuchar. Um, just a few opening thoughts as we, we get started. Um, as perhaps many of you know, the global system of trade and investment was designed to favor the control and influence of powerful transnational corporations over our daily lives and over the decisions that governments make at all levels. It contributes to the monopoly control of just a few transnational corporations over the fossil fuel guzzling agribusiness whose pro products are often transported thousands of miles before they reach a dinner table. And at the same time, the system has been decisive in undermining the countryside and making the lives of millions of small scale farmers more precarious, undermining their role as a better alternative to mass monoculture operations. Similarly, it weighs very heavily on the definition of energy policies that have already gone through processes of privatization in many places and is highly influential in decisions taking place on mineral and fossil fuel extraction, as well as related infrastructure. Awareness of these threats has given rise to broad and diverse processes of resistance over the years. From the perspective of my work with mining affected people and now decades into the installment of the system, uh, we're seeing its devastating effects and the rise of resistance from farmers, indigenous peoples and other communities 
facing the detrimental impacts of this highly destructive model of capitalist development that's been accompanied by violent processes of repression and militarization and often targeted violence against land and environment defenders and living with the way that it's tied the hands of governments to do the bidding of big business rather to respond to the urgent needs that we need to make fundamental change for people and the planet. We're gonna talk and go a little bit more in depth on these threats posed by the unjust global trade and investment regime with particular consideration for the extractive sectors. And I'm grateful that we we're combining agribusiness today with mining oil and gas. I think sometimes we don't see agro, agribusiness as being an extractive industry when really it is in the way that it grabs land and, and destroys the land uh, through intensive uh, monoculture extraction and of, of crops. And uh, we're joined by three specialists who are going to help us to reflect on the different ways in which the system continues to support fossil fuel interests, as well as what a more just sustainable trading and investment order might look like. We're gonna start uh, with an opening round of contributions from Luciana, Karen, and Manuel of about 10 minutes each. And then in response, and we're gonna focus first on the question of how does the current trade and investment system continue to support fossil fuel interests? And then we'll do a follow-up round of another five minutes or so to focus on a bit more on what alternatives we, should, we need to be fighting for. Um, and then I hope that we'll have some time for questions and answers for, from those of you joining us today. So please, throughout the talk, feel free to put your questions into the, the question and answer chat, and we will uh, draw on those a little bit further into the event. Um, so we're going to start with Luciana, uh, Luciana Giotto. Luciana is an associate researcher with the Transnational Institute. She specializes on trade and investment. She's a researcher in Argentina's National Scientific and Technical Research Council, CONICET Argentina, e professor, and professor of international political economy at the San Martin National University. Luciana, thanks for joining us today. Could you share a bit of a big picture overview of how the current global trade and investment rules favor corporate profits over life itself, contributing to climate change and impeding the change we need to address it? Yes, Jen, thank you. So I'll go in English for translation purposes, um, just because my presentation was uh, thought of in, in, in English. So I, I, help, I hope this makes sense what I say today. Um, so first of all, when we discuss free trade and, and fossil fuels industry, I want to first go to the step of trying to understand the meaning of trade in this society. Because when we discuss, for example, pro proposals, alternatives that I know that we're going to discuss afterwards, but just to, to think about this, um, we usually use also the same word trade, green trade, green and red trade, new green deals and trade. And how do we understand trade? So first of all is when we talk about trade, we talk about the system of production also. So for example, uh, Karl Marx, 150 years ago, he understood that the surplus value production was not only made, and the, the, the production of commodities was not only made inside the industries, uh, but there you have the process of exploiting the worker, but then the commodity in order to be actually to, to create a gain for the capitalist, it has to go to the market. So now when we talk about the market, we talk about global markets, we talk about the sphere of circulation of capital, and we talk about circulation of capital, we're talking about trade. So we're talking about the form of exchange that in capitalism takes the, the form of what we call trade now. So import, export, export for states, and the circulation of uh, thousands of vessels and planes right now, not only for tourism, but for uh, the transport of commodities all around the world. So, the first thing when we think about trade is this, is that trade is the form, is, is a form of capital in the way of uh, circulation. And so one of the aims, and this leads to the second point that I want to bring, one of the aims of capital is to make that circulation faster, simpler, 
easier. What is the meaning of that? Who would not make <laughs> trade easier or faster? Well, the state, state regulation. State regulation is understood as the burden of bureaucracy, right? When we see the OCDE uh, documents, for example, or even uh, some documents from corporations, what we see is that they are aiming all the time, even now, even in 2022, we're still seeing these corporations pushing for faster and simpler circulation of commodities. So making trade easier and simpler. Why would that be important? Because that would make capital quicker. So that it would mean that they, they would get their gain quicker in an easier way. We see this, for example, in the discussions in WTO right now. WTO, the World Trade Organization, is discussing investment facilitation uh, regulations or measures related to this, related to how do we make, these this guys say, how do we make states get away from any kind of regulation on the trade agenda? Uh, so what we see that the way that regulation appears is also uh, through the signing of this, all, now we almost have 30 years of free trade agreements and uh, bilateral investment treaties, in treaties that have been uh, thought of and have been prepared to protect um, capital to protect the foreign investor against the domestic investor, right? So states cannot actually uh, aim for the development of uh, national industries or national capital because they have to treat foreign capital the same they treat uh, the, for the foreign investor or foreign capital. So these treaties that actually WTO on the one side and then the FTAs and BITs have created this enormous architecture, legal architecture, that what we see is what, what a friend of ours, uh, Juan Hernandez Uvisarreta calls um, the architecture of impunity. No, this, this legal architecture that has been thought of and has reproduced for the past 30 years and has spread like brass, actually. Uh, and what we see is these agreements that have been thought of and have been aimed for uh, giving uh, legal security and certainties to capital, and it has nothing to do with protection of human rights or protection of, of um, environmental rights, for example. And the last point that I wanted to bring in this first round, so I, I get uh, only to my 10 minutes, is how, the, how we see the effects of the signing of these bilateral investment treaties and free trade agreements. Right now, we have to acknowledge that there are almost 3,000 bilateral investment treaties worldwide. So we're talking about an enormous network of treaties that cover investment everywhere in the world. Um, and this has had huge impacts. And now bringing also the fossil fuels industry, what we see is that after the, the um, fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, after the USSR was no longer there, what we saw is the need to protect, especially the investors in Russian territory that, uh, well, we see now the, the effects with the, with, the, with the war, right? Um, but in the 90s, the, the need was to actually protect the European investors in Russian territory after the disappearance of the USSR. And so to have uh, also quick and easy and, um, and uh, with, no, uh, with no barriers access to the oil in the northern part of Russia and the gas, no oil and gas. And so they signed this, uh, this treaty that is actually a treaty made especially for protection of fossil fuel industries, which is the Energy Charter Treaty. Uh, this ECT, the Energy Charter Treaty, is a treaty that has been already used by investors to, in order to exactly this, protect their own investment in front of any change of policies that the states could do that could affect their investment in fossil fuel industry. The thing is that we see this was signed in the early 90s, but now we are 30 years after that. 30 years after that, we have the energy transition discussion. We have the European uh, countries signing uh, in 2021 the global call to clean power tr a transition statement. And there are many, many documents and many compromises where the Euro European Union says, in 2035, we want to uh, we won't allow any other car with um, gas in it. So we have to force and push for energy transition. 
So 30 years after uh, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, what we found, find now is that the global, ener the global uh, climate crisis has pushed for other kinds of uh, regulations from states that actually put in jeopardy the investments of these uh, corporations in fossil fuel industry. So what we see through the ECT, for example, is that there are 124 cases, claims by the investors against the states, especially European states. So this has been a huge backlash on, on, the, on these countries that actually have used the system in their favor everywhere else in the world. And now they have uh, got all the claims against themselves through the ECT. For example, 50 of these claims have been against Europe, um, against Spain, sorry, against Spain, uh, especially by um, investors in su supposedly sustainable uh, energy sources, but that were speculate speculating against Spain and the changes and the crisis inside, the, the economic crisis inside Spain. So they can use this, this uh, kind of, of, um, of legal uh, umbrellas in order to make more uh, business, so actually get more gains like the cases of, of Spain, or just protect their investments until the states have to regulate somehow. And there are some very uh, loud cases that have been really, really, um, yeah, very well known everywhere because even the press was really, uh, took these cases as, as, as very spectacular cases like Rock Hopper against Italy, where the protection of the sea and uh, the investor states, uh, investor states no, the investors' rights uh, were uh, directly um, in, co in collision. So um, one last thing that I want to bring here is uh, the impacts in Latin America of this system. Well, in Latin America, 22% of the claims that investors have uh, done against states of the region are actually in the mining and oil sector. Ecuador is one, probably one of the cases that we have seen as a very, very loud case showing the impacts of this system, when a, not only with a, a big case of Chevron against Ecuador, but also other companies that like Perenco or Burlington that are uh, French companies, uh, oil companies, that actually sued the state in, in, in the in, in international arbitration when the state changed some uh, clauses regarding the amount of taxes that these companies had to pay to the state uh, in order to give back some of these revenues that they have to Ecuadorian population. So these are just some main ideas just to show how the system has been thought uh, as a system to protect capital, to protect investors, not to protect human rights, not to protect uh, environmental rights. And now that the global crisis, the global climate crisis is showing that there, there is need to go through a different path. We see that the, the backlash of this, of this uh, see the whole system, the whole regime is going on states. And now it surely, I would say, it surely asks or yeah, actually requests from states to uh, have a different kind of regulation regarding their the foreign investment and of course regarding environmental and human rights i'll finish there now thank you so much luciana um it's very helpful to have this this big overview and now we're going to go a little bit uh deeper into how this is reflected in the scope of, of agribusiness, uh, for which I'm going to call on Karen Hansen Kuhn, who's the program director at the Institute for Agricultural and Trade, Trade Policy. She leads IITP's work on trade policy and ensures synergies amongst their programs on trade, farm systems, and climate and economic justice. Um, Karen, could you talk a bit about how industrial agriculture is contributing to climate change and how the current trade rules at the, at the WTO and in bi bilateral deals is favoring corporate control over this sector right today? Sure. And I do want to thank Luciana for that overview. I think we need that kind of framing before we focus in specifically. And I want to focus not only on agriculture, but specifically on fertilizers. Often when we talk about agriculture and climate change, the focus is on 
carbon emissions from land use change and deforestation. And that is very important, but it's not the only emission. There's also methane emissions. Methane is very potent, but short-lived. A lot of that is from animal production. It's also from natural gas. Natural gas is used to produce nitrogen fertilizers. The fertilizers are basically made from natural gas and electricity. So it's energy and air uh, to make, and it results in emissions of nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is a gas we don't talk about a lot, but it is 273 times more potent than carbon and stays in the atmosphere over a hundred years. We've been working with some scientists along with Greenpeace and Grain to think about how increased fertilizer use is affecting climate change. Uh, fertilizer use has been increasing all over the world. It is part of a very key part of green revolution practices. Um, and, but I think there hasn't been enough consideration of the greenhouse gas impacts of that production. The scientists we worked with found that if you look at the production where they bring the natural gas and the energy together, the transportation and the impacts in the field, it amounts to more than 21% of emissions from agriculture. And it's been growing. I wanna share this works. Um, an image that I found really kind of shocking. It's not only that nitrogen fertilizers create emissions, but that they are so entirely overused because they've been so cheap. So you can see in this map, all of the ones in orange and red are countries that are using more nitrogen fertilizers than the crops can even absorb. So all of that excess, you know, in addition to the emissions, of course, contributes waterways and causes any number of problems. But the incentives right now in the agricultural system are for extreme overproduction, especially of commodity crops like corn and soybean and wheat. Um, and that requires these cheap chemical inputs. Let's see. Um, so, we have this problem, how do we fix it? Well, it seems to me the, the obvious solution is to reduce the need for all these fertilizers. And there are important agroecological solutions being advanced in many countries, planting, using plants that fix nitrogen in the soil, composting, crop rotation, all of these are things that should be considered more, should be the basis of agriculture and are under control of the farmers. They don't rely on imports or trade uh, in these chemical inputs. The other way to reduce it would be to make that production more efficient. So with all of this, we have this sector where, which is producing a lot of these, these emissions, including from fossil fuels through the methane. So how does trade fit in? Well, we see a really clear example right now in Europe where they are considering in the process of finalizing a carbon border adjustment measure. So within Europe, uh, the CBAM mostly applies to things like uh, aluminum and steel and cement, but fertilizer is part of it as well. And in this example, there are a lot of firms in Europe that are modernizing their plants, so they'll be more energy efficient, and they say they need protection in order to do that. So under this plan, uh, fertilizer imports coming from other countries that don't have an emissions trading system, that don't have the same standards, would have to pay a fee, a, a carbon fee tied to the price of carbon. Um, the idea is then it would raise those prices up to the levels being paid by others in Europe and make it more efficient. I think whenever we are talking about solutions, like a CBAM, we have to think not does this work with the trade rules, but does this actually get us where we want to go? And so I would start with three questions. One is, will it work? Will it reduce the emissions? Maybe. Um, maybe these plants become more efficient, but maybe some firms will just decide to produce those same crops in other countries. Or maybe in cases where a country has 
two factories, one that's more efficient than the other, they just export from the efficient factory and there's no change in emissions. So maybe it'll work. Is it legal? Under existing WTO rules, there is an exception for, for protection of human health or the environment, but only to protect those issues, not to protect jobs, which is clearly this is initiative in, in the EU is about both. It's about keeping that industry going for good or bad uh, and about helping the environment. So is it legal? Yeah, maybe. Is it fair? Now here I would say the answer is really no. Uh, it affects countries very unevenly. Most of the imports coming in of fertilizer from nearby countries like Russia or Egypt, but there are some, there are imports coming from countries like Senegal. In the case of Senegal, their exports to Europe of fertilizer amount to between two and 5% of their entire GDP. So it would be a huge problem for them. And there's nothing in this, in this initiative that would give them the technology they need to make changes. In fact, there are strong incentives against that in the trade deals. There's nothing in this initiative that would give them resources to make that transition. It specifically says all of the resources will be kept internally uh, to foster the change within Europe. So I would say it's not a great solution. And overall, I think the problem is it still incentivizes dependence on fertilizers. We need a transition to agroecology, but what we're getting in the trade deals are locking in new incentives to continue with business as usual. If we look at the, US, the renegotiated NAFTA, the USMCA, there's a new chapter on agricultural biotechnology that streamlines the process for approving both GMOs and products of gene editing. Um, there are also in both that agreement and the TPP, restrictions on seed, sa on seed saving and sharing. It requires countries to sign on to a whole other treaty protecting plant, plant breeders. Um, so we have all of these incentives built in, and I think what's in this new NAFTA will probably be the model for the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework or perhaps the Americas Agreement if that should move forward. We have this sort of business as usual, I would say outdated approach to really critical problems that aren't meeting the needs we have. So I think, I think I'll just leave it at that. But I, as I see it, this is sort of a concrete example of how these rules go wrong. Thanks very much, Karen. Yes, that's, that's very clear about how the WTO and how these trade agreements have really stacked the rules against the, the kind of uh, change that we need. Um, and just underscoring your emphasis on agricultural uh, agroecology as a direction we need to go in. You've you've noted in some of your writing that um, <clears throat> the intergovernmental panel on climate change has affirmed uh, the importance of agroecology um, both to uh, support climate mitigation and adoption. And hopefully we can go a bit further into that in the second round. Um, we're going to turn now to Manuel Perez Rocha, who is going to uh, give his presentation in Spanish. Uh, Manuel, un colega mía, mío, es eh, investigador afiliado con el Instituto de Estudios Políticos en Washington y también afiliado del Instituto Transnacional. Eh, ha trabajado con redes en América Latina y México por eh, muchos años y en, en cuanto a México en particular por dos décadas para promover eh, pues formas eh, de comercio y inversión más justa y sostenible y también es columnista eh, para el, el periódico La Jornada en México. Eh, Manuel, ¿nos puede dar un un resumen o un, ir un poco más a fondo sobre las reglas de inversión, cómo, cómo funciona y cómo eh, las, los, las demandas eh, de arbitraje supranacional de las empresas está siendo utilizado para obstaculizar eh, el cambio necesario para enfrentar el cambio climático. Sí, muchas gracias, Jen. Yo voy a hablar un poco sobre el accionar 
de las organizaciones sociales y civiles ante este sistema de protección de inversiones que ha sido descrito un poco por Luciana. Eh, y me voy a referir a una carta que fue firmada por decenas, más bien cientos de organizaciones de todo el mundo, en la que exigimos a los gobiernos pues de todo el mundo también el remover de una vez por todas el infame mecanismo de solución de controversias inversionista-estado, mejor conocido como ISDS o ISDS, por sus siglas en inglés. Esta fue una carta que se, se elaboró y se entregó en el contexto de la pasada cumbre eh, de las partes en Egipto, de la cumbre para el cambio climático. Eh, como también mencionó Luciana, <coughs> los casi 3.000 Tratados de libre comercio y de inversión contienen cláusulas ISDS que permiten a las corporaciones saltar a las cortes nacionales y los sistemas jurídicos nacionales y llevar a los estados al banquillo de los acusados. Normalmente en el CIADI, es el tribunal más utilizado, el Centro Internacional de Arreglos de Disputas de Inversiones del Banco Mundial. Eh, y... Por, por, por cláusulas que voy a describir más adelante, ¿no? Bajo cláusulas que están contenidos en los tratados de libre comercio y los tratados bilaterales de inversión. Estas demandas eh, son por montos cada vez más altos, montos que llegan a los miles de millones de dólares. Y lo que me parece muy importante es que, bueno, junto con TNI, este, nosotros IPS siempre estamos haciendo cálculos de, de estas demandas, de cuánto, a cuánto ascienden, pero realmente es un ejercicio, este un tanto fútil, eh, no, no digo inútil, pero las, los cálculos son imposibles de, de hacer, porque cuando menos una tercera parte de estas este, demandas no se tiene ninguna información ni de la cantidad por la que están siendo demandados los estados. Esto a mí me parece suma, import, sumamente importante, porque además de hablar de la gran secrecía que hay, también a mí me hace suponer que hay un círculo de corrupción tremendo en este sistema, ¿no? Eh, hablamos muchas veces de la puerta revolvente o de la puerta giratoria, de revolving door en inglés, de cómo funcionarios públicos que han negociado estos tratados pasan después a ser parte de despachos de abogados o de las juntas de las empresas. Entonces, todo un sistema eh, elitista, digamos, en el cual tanto funcionarios públicos como empresas eh, utilizan esta puerta revolvente. Y esto es eh, importante porque muchas veces nos hacen la pregunta, ¿pero por qué los gobiernos firman estos tratados este, si van a ser demandados? Bueno, justamente porque estos funcionarios participan de este gran festín de este sistema, ¿no? Eh, bueno, entonces en la carta eh, en el que llamamos por el fin de este sistema, por el fin del sistema de demandas e inversión en este Estado, en la carta se explica que los principales riesgos del sistema son, uno, el aumento de lo que cuesta a los estados el actuar ante la crisis climática, dado que las corporaciones pueden reclamar exorbitantes cantidades de dinero del erario público por medio del sistema de, eh, de demandas ante estos opacos eh, tribunales supranacionales. Y yo subrayo siempre que son supranacionales, no internacionales, porque son tribunales que están por encima de los estados, ¿no? No, no, no son necesariamente los gobiernos los que están este, participando en la solución de las controversias. Eh, segundo, el, el, el otro riesgo del sistema eh, es el enfriamiento regulatorio, pues el chilling effect se le dice en inglés, pues el temor a, a ser demandados hace también que gobiernos retrasen o decidan no tomar las med medidas necesarias en materia climática como ya ha ocurrido. Al final voy a mostrar un mapa, porque si lo hago ahorita me voy a hacer bolas con la tecnología, pero un mapa que tenemos de distintas, eh, distintas uh, casos a, a, a nivel del mundo en el que empresas han logrado este, frenar cambios regulatorios en favor del clima. Eh, y bueno, en... En lo que se dice en la declaración, las comunidades que se encuentran en la primera línea de la crisis climática a menudo están en el centro de las denuncias de ISDS a través de las luchas contra la minería destructiva y otros proyectos extractivos. 
Eso lo documentamos en, un, en este documento que se llama Casino del Extractivismo o Extraction Casino en inglés. Nada más hay que googlear el nombre y aquí pon, eh, hacemos una semblanza de cómo las empresas mineras apuestan con la vida de los pueblos y la soberanía de los países de América Latina, en este caso, en este documento, pero es a nivel mundial, ¿no? A través del arbitraje supranacional. Eh, bueno, en el documento, en, perdón, en la, en la declaración a la que hago referencia y que voy a compartir el, el vínculo, y el, se hace un llamado a dejar de negociar, firmar, ratificar a todos los países o a unirse a acuerdos que incluyan estas cláusulas, ¿no? Eh, se hace un llamado específico a tratados como el Tratado de la Carta de la Energía o el eufemísticamente llamado Tratado Integral y Progresista de Asociación Transpacífico, mejor conocido como el TPP. ¿no? Digo eufemística porque esas palabras como integral y progresista pues este, están estos tratados cada vez más aderezados con cláusulas que tienen pues poca, poca fuerza, cláusulas como por ejemplo de... Este, de pequeñas y medianas empresas, eh, cláusulas eh, sobre equidad de género, pero pues que realmente tienen poca efectividad, pocos mecanismos para hacerlos cumplir, a diferencia de las cláusulas fuertes, como la cláusula de protección de inversiones. Eh, bueno, las alternativas, vamos a hablar más tarde un poco de ellas, pero existen, incluida la resolución de diferencias entre estados, de estado a estado, el, los seguros de riesgo de inversión, la colaboración internacional para reforzar los sistemas jurídicos nacionales para que las empresas se sientan mejor cobijadas bajo sistemas nacionales y no supranacionales. Y por supuesto, la gran alternativa que tenemos y estamos trabajando son mecanismos regionales e internacionales de derechos humanos, como el tratado eh, que se está, por el que estamos trabajando durante muchos años, un tratado eh, de protección que haga responsable a las empresas ante los, ante los derechos humanos. Es un tratado a nivel de la ONU. Eh, la buena, hay buenas noticias también. Este, muchos países, eh, Alemania, Francia, Países Bajos, España, etcétera, se están retirando del Tratado de la Carta de la Energía, que es un tratado que le da protección y, y privilegios a las empresas de... De, de industrias fósiles, gas y petróleo, eh, también minería y energía, y estos países europeos se están retirando. Y hay muchos otros países en el mundo que también están cancelando sus tratados bilaterales de inversión, este, desde Indonesia a países en América Latina que también se han retirado del CIAD y etcétera. O sea, hay una, como se dice en inglés, un backlash, un, 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 hay un cada vez más una noción de que realmente eh, los países están siendo, eh, están teniendo que retirarse de estos tratados. Pero, sin embargo, eh, en el caso de Europa, y sobre todo Europa sigue empujando por firmar estos tratados con, con México, con Chile, está tratando de modernizar sus tratados para que incluyan estas cláusulas de protección de inversiones y también con Mercosur. Entonces, yo creo que lo que se está dando es un neocolonialismo en el cual, mientras los países ricos se dan cuenta de que estos tratados les afectan y se retiran de ellos, están, están sin embargo, siguiendo impulsando este sistema, ¿no? Eh, entonces, resulta incoherente, ¿no? Y una prueba de un neocolonialismo en ascenso eh, que se siga imponiendo a países periféricos. Y aún más que esto, se dejen arrastrar. En efecto, muchos países de Asia, África y hasta América Latina eh, están en espera de, de adherirse incluso a este tratado del, de, de la Carta de la Energía. Y otros TLCs, eh, Guatemala, Panamá, Colombia y Chile están todavía haciendo cola para adherirse al tratado de la Carta de Energía. Eh, y bueno, pues yo creo que ojalá en América Latina que tenemos a flamantes gobiernos progresistas como de Petro y Boric, So, se retiren de esta, de esta intención, pero lástima también con el recién apoyo de Boric para la ratificación del Tratado Transpacífico en Chile, pues ya la decepción empieza a permear, ¿no? Y lo mismo con el apoyo del gobierno de Andrés Manuel López Obrador a los tratados de libre comercio y de protección de inversiones, 
que son las armas fundamentales del neoliberalismo, pues hay uh, bastante decepción. Entonces, bueno, para concluir, es urgente terminar con el sistema de protección de inversiones a nivel global y en eso estamos trabajando. Voy a tratar de ver si puedo compartir pantalla, pero mejor lo hago en, en la siguiente oportunidad que tenga de hablar. Muchas gracias. Thanks very much, Manuel. We're going to move into a second round now um, to talk a bit more about um, alternatives and movements uh, that are struggling against this unjust system of trade and investment that has locked us into such unfair um, and deleterious arrangements. Um, and I just want to encourage those of you who are listening as well, if you have questions, to start to put them into the question and answer box, and we'll uh, look at those for uh, some a further round once we get through um, this one here. So I want to I want to come back to you, Luciana. Um, Manuel has already mentioned how, um, in response to some of these huge claims from the fossil fuel industry against uh, countries in Europe. Um, with these massive arbitration claims that they're starting to um, withdraw from, from the Energy Charter, Charter Treaty that, that you referenced as one of the big obstacles to the sort of change we need to confront climate change. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, the movement that's made that possible um, and what more needs to happen um, to really explore um, alternative train and investment relationships. Thanks. Yeah, sure, Jen. Um, yeah, when we think about what we described and, and the three of us have been describing um, how the system works, surely we, in order to make good strategies, we have to understand how the system works. So it's not unnecessary or it's not, uh, irrelevant to have this kind of analysis. We have to understand how it works. We have to understand how we, the system is moving. We have to understand how the system is evolving in order to understand how to react against it. Um, so what we see is the following is that, is that um, first of all, how is it evolving? If the FTAs and bids are the rules of capital, what we see is that the needs of capital have also evolved in these 30 years. So we see these trade agreements that are more and more aggressive with new topics. For example, all the something that we have not talked about here because well, topics are enormous, but um, for example, uh, digital trade issues, e-commerce, what is generally call, called e-commerce, regulatory coherence, New chapters that are actually uh, super uh, according to the cap to capital's needs. So when we understand how the system moves, we can try to understand how we can move against it, which is really difficult because when we discuss the trade agreements and investment protection, I think, uh, from my point of view, is that we're talking about the heart of the system, how the capitalist system needs these legal uncertainties because these legal certainties are actually um, what maintains, what keeps uh, the, the system going for these corporations, what actually keeps globalization and global value changes going. So first of all, how, how to move against this? Well, of course, this system has created a lot of, uh, a lot, a lot of resistance, a lot, a lot of critics uh, since day one, practically. When we see uh, 1991 and sorry, 1999 and uh, Seattle battle, when we see now, when I talked about this to, to my young students, they have no idea what we're talking about. That is really depressing, surely. But for me, for example, that I was praised politically and academically in the, uh, in the spotlight of what was the, the resistance against WTO, what was the Cancun round, for example, no, the Cancun ministerial and the Doha round and, and the battle against the, or the struggles against ALCA, the free trade area of the Americas in, for example, in countries like Argentina, which was really strong. Then we see that resistance has been ongoing since day one. Uh, but the thing is that what can we do now, 30 year, eight years after? Are we winning or are we losing or where are we? Well, we're certainly in a very difficult spot <laughs> because we have tried to create alternatives and uh, there are many alternatives going on, but they are not uh, maybe um, 
well known enough or they have not been, of course, made known by media, of course, that, that is for sure. So what we see actually is that uh, what we can surely do is actually press governments to change their positions inside the system. If we talk about that there are 200 states around, maybe 200 states in the world, so we have 200 states that can actually change the, the, for example, the investment protection regime. So we should start like also, besides the creation of alternatives in the different territories, also start pressing the states to change some of these. Manuel already said, uh, he said about how some states have withdrawn from the Energy Charter Treaty, which, which has been actually a huge victory. We have to actually say, yay, we did that because the movements have organized in Europe especially, and they have been super accurate in trying to show how the, the, yeah, the craziness, the rationality of this system that protects these corporations that come from um, the fossil fuels industry and actually go right against what the European Union is saying that it, it's going to do in the next 15 years. So that one of the one of the things that it shows is that you can actually aim at the heart of the system and gain get some victories there. So what do we do in Latin America? In some countries of Latin America, for example, we still go on with these struggles. We still try to push states to get out of the system. So we say no more FTAs, so we can have no more FTAs. One slogan that we use is that there is no new green deal with FTAs. There is no new green deal with free trade agreements. So in order to have a new, um, let's say, dialogue on, on uh, energy transition, you need states to get out of these uh, treaties that actually only give, uh, in, um, only give uh, privileges to these corporations. So first, no more bids, no more bilateral investment treaties, no more FTAs. We want, as Manuel was saying before, we want states to get out of the system. We want states to prohibit arbitration as Ecuador has done inside its constitution, Article 422 of Ecuadorian constitution actually prohibits arbitration. And the new neoliberal government is trying by all its means to actually uh, put that down. And they are struggling against the Article 422 with dozens of, of lawyers to try to find a way to go through the 422, the Article 422, but they can't, they still can't. So we have uh, regulations in the national uh, level that act can actually change where we can push. And the final thing is that what we need also is audit commissions like Ecuador did also. Uh, what is this? Well, we need audit commissions, audit groups that actually try to get all the information available on how the system works inside the countries. Why is this important? Because we're far behind regarding information and analysis on this. Maybe analysis will have more, but we need more academics, engaged academics, progressive academics that are actually engaged in understanding and researching and creating uh, different kinds of, uh, of researches that aim at trying to understand the impacts of free trade and of investment protection. In Latin America, for example, we are far behind regarding these topics. So we need the commissions, we need states to actually establish commissions to understand the impacts of the system. And these commissions have to be independent, they have to be autonomous, they have to be scientific, scientifically based. They cannot be made by people from the foreign affairs ministers, because then they will say, oh, everything is fine. No, we need independent researchers, internationally known researchers that actually can go there and understand in a, in a period of time exactly the impacts of investment protection system. So we have alternatives. Are these the, the best alternatives? Well, actually they are quite defensive alternatives, but what we need is actions to take, uh, act, act, states to take action right now regarding these, these topics. I finished here. Thank you so much, Luciana. And, um, and it, I, I do think it's really important to, to recall all of the resistance to the system from the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm Canadian and I remember the pushback too to the free trade agreement between the US and Canada even before Mexico came in and then the mobilizations against the, the MIA um, in the 90s. And uh, it really feels like um, it's important to, to recall those struggles and, and, and the, the struggle against the, the totality of the system that 
functions as as a whole to to support corporate um, control uh, around the world and and that sometimes feels like right now we're we're looking at piecemeal ways of going after it um, now that it's been so firmly installed um, around in, in just about every country of the world. Um, so thank you so much for that. And um, and maybe we'll come back to thinking more about how we can maybe tackle some of the myths around the current global trade and investment rules that I think are really prevalent, like this presumption that, you know, that we, we should accept that companies need legal stability and uh, and certainty when when that we actually need to disrupt that because we need to make really fundamental change. Um, and so how do, how do we tackle that? I want to move on though to Karen and um, to hear from you and, and feel free to, to reflect on anything that, that Luciana has shared, Karen, um, as I'd like to hear you talk a bit about where you're seeing um, some of the most exciting struggles in, in favor of agroecology, in favor of greater food sovereignty, um, and alternatives uh, to the trade rules that, that are obstructing um, those changes and that are holding in this business as usual, as, as you've called it. I think at first I want to echo a couple of the points Luciana made. I think, as you were saying too, we have to, we have to claim our victories. Uh, there have been times like the free trade area of the Americas, civil society, social movements defeated that, both with mostly with mobilization, but also with developing critiques and analysis alternatives along the way. Um, and that was an important win. I think also the weakening of ISDS recently is because of civil society, and I think there, there is more to be done. Um, with agroecology, it is advancing all over the world. Uh, we've started a, a little series on our website tracking some of these cases. And I think right now, one of the challenges is there is this idea of co-opting the notion of agroecology so that it's only about what inputs you use um, instead of looking at the fuller picture that includes food sovereignty and each country, each nation's each community's ability to decide the food system that they want. And I think along those lines, I would just highlight a, a specific case where I think the challenge to the trade rules has been really useful and, and instructive. And that is in Mexico, the phase out of GMO corn and glyphosate. This is something that was a commitment by Lopez Obrador as he came into office and a direct response to pressure from social movements, particularly the no corn, no country campaign, um, which called for an end to GMOs. After, I think about two years ago, he issued a decree saying those things would be phased out as of the beginning of 2024. Now, in the meantime, so we have the new NAFTA that has this terrible chapter on ag biotech, but what's interesting is kind of what they miss. It's like there's this whole process that says you have to streamline the approval process. It has to be based on science. Um, no mention of the precautionary principle, but there are all these steps. You have to have a process. It has to be transparent. But then at the end, it says, but nothing here says what the decision will be. Well, so in the case of GMOs in, in Mexico, the government is saying, we're having a process and we've decided we don't want this. And there's been a huge pushback um, from agribusiness in the United States who say this is illegal under the trade agreement, that they cannot um, require that these exports you know, be, be non-GMO, when in fact it's right there in writing. Um, we've also had an interesting movement from non-GMO producers in the US who say, we have corn, we'll sell it. You don't have to pick these other guys. So there's a sort of contradiction going on there that I think is instructive. Um, but what's interesting and I think, and, and perhaps not as encouraging in this case is even though the text, what they, they all agree to is very clear, the narrative is that Mexico cannot change the conditions. So far, Mexico is, has made some concessions. They've said maybe for animal feed, they would allow GMOs, but not, not other kinds of corn. But in any case, so far they're standing firm. 
And there's enormous pressure coming from different places in the United States on this issue. And so my hope is that that's not a tr complete transition to agroecology, right? But it is a nation because of social pressure deciding that they are going to make this change in their food system, no matter what the trade, trade deal says. And I hope that we can see more of those kinds of examples. And I hope that we can also work across borders to encourage that and to continue to, to challenge the notion that this is what anybody has agreed to. I think I'll just leave it at that for now. Thanks very much, Karen. Um, I'd like to, to hand it back to Manuel um, to also share some of your thoughts about um, you've already mentioned some examples of how and where governments are starting to get out of ISDS in particular. Um, you've also mentioned some examples of cases uh, where governments that were hoped to make more change in this, this area have actually not confronted the system at all, or have been quite silent on it, or even made great concessions, uh, such as the example that you provide of Boric in Chile. Um, could you talk a bit more about what sort of movement you think is necessary to move us further away um, from ISDS and the unjust rules that are in these free trade agreements and bilateral investment treaties? Sí, gracias, Jen. Y disculpa que hablé muy rápido. Apenas veo en el chat que me pidieron que hablara más despacito. Así es que voy a tratar de ir más despacio esta vez. Eh, quiero sumar a la lista de victorias y que tenemos que, como decimos en México, cacarear el huevo, like cackle the egg, no, no sé si es la traducción al inglés, eh, la victoria eh, de, de derrotar el acuerdo multilateral de inversiones allá por finales de los años noventas, el AMI o the MI en inglés. Esa fue una victoria muy fuerte de la sociedad civil internacional y después también la batalla de Seattle tuvo que ver mucho con ello. La batalla de Seattle fue para evitar que la OMC incorporara el tema de inversiones en su propia agenda, ¿no? O sea, que la OMC se atribuyera eh, reglas de facilitación y de protección de inversiones a, a sí misma. Entonces, la OMC continúa siendo estrictamente para temas comerciales y no de inversiones. Eso no quiere decir que, bueno, seguimos contando con 3,000 tratados bilaterales de inversión que representan ya una, un reto enorme, ¿no? Eh, cuando hablamos de, cuando nos preguntamos qué alternativas planteamos, hay que hacernos la pregunta de, de que, a qué estamos buscando alternativas. ¿Alternativas a qué? ¿Alternativas al capitalismo? Eh, o alternativas más acotadas, alternativas dentro de un capitalismo que asumimos que realistamente eh, no vamos a salir en décadas de él. Eh, entonces, yo creo que hay que manejar ese tema de alternativas dentro de distintas perspectivas, ¿no? Perspectivas utópicas, que por supuesto es poner fin a un sistema capitalista, patriarcal, eh, neocolonial, en el que estamos inmersos, pero también siendo realistas, este, alternativas más, más concretas y más este, posibles. ¿no? También yo creo que es importante poner alternativas, para, para, para manejar el tema de las alternativas hay que tener también algunos fundamentos teóricos como la importancia de desterrar la teoría de la necesidad del crecimiento permanente. ¿no? Eh, recién falleció uno de los principales o, o, o originales eh, desterradores de, este, de, este, de esta teoría y creencia de la necesidad del crecimiento permanente, Herman Daly, que fue en su tiempo economista del Banco Mundial y, y después renunció y se dedicó a pues, crear e impulsar un poco esta corriente que, es, que en inglés se llama degrowth o la, la, las teorías del decrecimiento, la necesidad de, de crecer para eh, comenzar a a, a dejar de destruir el, el planeta, ¿no? Eh, Herman Daly una vez me tocó ver una charla de él y, y decía con su increíble humor, 
lo absurdo que es que Estados Unidos esté exportando galletas a Suecia y que Suecia esté exportando galletas a Estados Unidos. Así, y, o sea, lo, lo, lo puso de una manera tan clara de, de cómo ahora México está buscando un tratado de libre comercio con Ecuador y Ecuador con México para que ambos estén exportando, import, exportando, importando productos que ambos producen, ¿no? Entonces está esta, esta, esta teoría del crecimiento y de la y de la que, que, que recae en toda la teoría de la, de, de, de la economía de la exportación, del sector exportador, del sector externo, es yo creo que fundamental empezar a desterrar esas, esas este, ideas que se impulsan desde los centros de, de pensamiento, como las universidades este, de Chicago, etcétera, los Chicago Boys, y sobre todo por el por el consenso de Washington y, y el Banco Mundial y el Fondo Monetario Internacional. ¿no? Pero bueno, en un sentido más acotado, nosotros y nosotras en nuestros trabajos ante los ante las tratados de inversión, hemos encontrado tres grandes esferas de alternativas. ¿no? Y les voy a decir eh, a grandes rasgos, una es propuestas en, en las que se prioricen la protección de los derechos humanos y en particular de los pueblos indígenas y del ambiente por, sobre, por encima de los derechos de los inversionistas. Es decir, en, en, en teoría también los derechos humanos tienen prioridad por encima de los derechos comerciales, pero en la, en la práctica no es así, porque los inversionistas cuentan con estas cláusulas bajo los tratados de libre comercio que les otorgan pues fuertes mecanismos para, para hacer cumplir sus derechos, ¿no? Otro es las propuestas de mecanismos alternativos de, so, de solución de controversias que no sean de una sola vía, como actualmente son, que solamente los empresarios pueden demandar los estados, que sean al, también al revés, que los, que los inversionistas tengan que cumplir eh, y, y, y responder en, en, incluso monetariamente, ¿no? A, a las demandas a las que también los estados puedan imponerles. Y también que las comunidades afectadas sean parte de, de la solución de controversias. Y tercero, las propuestas para eliminar todos los privilegios, privilegios que se dan a inversionistas extranjeros y garantizar a los estados el espacio, lo que se llama uh, Space Policy, para poder diseñar e implementar políticas públicas este, que fomenten el desarrollo local, el desarrollo nacional, que puedan los estados tener, por ejemplo, la posibilidad de, de, de fomentar a las empresas nacionales y locales sin tener que ser demandadas porque empresas este, extranjeras creen que no les están dando el mismo trato, ¿no? Por ejemplo. Bueno, eh, pues aquí dejo esto. Yo pues insisto que que el decir qué alternativas queremos, tenemos que buscar, tenemos que encontrarlas en, en, muchas, este, en muchas formas de pensamiento. ¿no? No, no se trata nada más de alternativas específicas, pero sí de tener una mirada utópica de ver cómo reemplazar este sistema capitalista patriarcal a largo plazo. Thanks very much, Manuel. Um, I'm seeing uh, a question in the chat and would just invite any of you who are, are listening to put any additional questions um, either into the chat or into the Q&A box. Um, and we will share that with our, um, our speakers. Um, the question from Christian Stahlberg is, uh, What's the UN's position on this matter, or have they not taken a position? Would anybody like to talk about um, how the UN has situated itself on these questions? Luciana? Uh, yeah, can I switch to Spanish, which is simpler for me? <laughs> no. Absolutely. Yes, please go uh, ahead. Absolutely. Thank you. Gracias. Uh, perdona los traductores. Um, a ver. Sí, la, la nación, no es que no haya eh, posición de las Naciones Unidas, pero lo que venimos describiendo con Manuel es la constitución de este, y eso es bien interesante, de esta, este régimen de protección de inversiones, esta arquitectura jurídica internacional, que se pone por encima de los derechos humanos. Y eso es muy importante de entender, porque lo que se constituyó es lo que 
los abogados plantean como hard, hard law, ¿sí? una ley dura. Ley dura que implica que estos inversores, en cuanto tienen su... Eh, in, in, interpretan que sus derechos eh, contractuales han sido vulnerados por una política de Estado, ellos automáticamente accionan las cláusulas dentro de los tratados de protección de las inversiones del Estado en el que están operando, que esté firmado con su eh, casa matriz, o sea, con su casa matriz, no, con el Estado donde está la casa matriz de esa empresa, sea Suiza, sea España, sea Italia, sea Estados Unidos, sea Canadá. Eh, esa hard law es lo que ha generado que los debates en las Naciones Unidas, obviamente, estén... Eh, justamente permeados por la presión de las corporaciones para mantener que eh, sus derechos y sus privilegios se mantengan en el mismo sentido. ¿Qué es lo que se ha hecho entonces? En los últimos 10 años se ha empujado dentro de Naciones Unidas un proceso para lograr un tratado vinculante que vincule justamente a las corporaciones transnacionales y los derechos humanos. Esto se ha discutido en el marco de la Comisión de Derechos Humanos al interior de Naciones Unidas pero lo que se ha visto es, y de una manera muy clara y muy eh, inevit o sea, inevitable, ¿no? No, no, uno mira eso y dice, claro, es obvio que los países, porque la Unión Unidas está compuesta por estados, entonces los países más industrializados, los países que tienen a sus empresas con capacidad de exportar capital, ¿sí? de salir a invertir al mundo, son los países que se oponen a que exista un tratado vinculante sobre corporaciones y derechos humanos. Países europeos, propio Estados Unidos y Canadá, eh, países como Japón, se oponen a que exista algo similar a esto. Y también lo que se va logrando es por lo menos ciertos debates en torno a que las empresas se hagan responsables por las violaciones de derechos humanos, o ambientales o laborales, en el marco de la cadena global de valor. Eso se lo conoce como due diligence, ¿no? Este, de hecho, no sé en castellano cómo es. Este, no sé si Manuel se acuerda. Eh, pero se lo conoce como el proceso por el cual las empresas están obligadas a hacerse cargo por las violaciones de derechos humanos, por ejemplo, en la cadena que ellos traccionan en el proceso productivo. Esto es algo que, vuelvo a decir, es, es un proceso bastante nuevo, es un proceso político, no es ni técnico ni académico, ni, ni tampoco es una cuestión solo de diplomáticos, estamos hablando de un proceso político donde la discusión que ha sido empujada por muchísimas organizaciones sociales a nivel mundial, lo que está tratando de hacer es poner, en, de vuelta, en el centro de la discusión, uno de los puntos principales, que es esta capacidad de las corporaciones de ponerse por encima de los derechos humanos, laborales o derechos medioambientales. No sé, Manu, si vos querés agregar después algo sobre eso. Manuel o Karen. Do you want to add anything about the UN's position in this regard? Um, I, I did just want to also throw into the chat um, a report that came out from the UN Working Group on Human Rights and Transnational Corporations um, last year, where, and I think this is also the result of a lot of people pushing from a lot of different spheres um, about how just absolutely perverse and unjust the the system is and in which um the un working group did come out and acknowledge this they call it imbalance um in the the recognition of of rights of corporate rights over over human rights um similarly uh, it discusses and i think a lot of this you know comes from the work of of based communities and has been written up by people like nicolas perón as well around the invisibility like the real colonial elements of this system that are built in and were thought of it were part of its sort of the imaginary that created the system um that that make invisible and exclude uh the most directly affected people indigenous people campesinos uh, and others from uh from these disputes and and from the exercise and enjoyment uh full of their fully of their rights um and recommends for states to either renegotiate or pull out of of these these trade and investment agreements um so that's uh, an interesting reference i think in response to your question as well um in in the absence of other questions in the chat for the moment um manuel do you want to add anything sure go ahead please and then sí, i'll, I'll throw another question out 
estaba muteado. Yo creo que a nivel de las Naciones Unidas hay una esquizofrenia total, porque por un lado hay los esfuerzos, sobre todo de países del sur global, con la sociedad civil, de llegar a este tratado vinculante sobre derechos humanos y empresas. Este, también hay en, en la UNTAD, la Conferencia de Desarrollo y Comercio de la ONU, esfuerzos para reformar el sistema y hacerlo, pues esfuerzos también a nivel internacional son muy, muy complicados, ¿no? Pero sigue existiendo en la misma ONU un, un mecanismo parecido al CIADI, ¿sí? un tribunal que se llama un CITRAL, que también permite a las empresas utilizar este sistema de un CITRAL para demandar a los estados. Entonces hay una total, un total este pues mosaico muy complicado a nivel de Naciones Unidas para lograr reformar este sistema. Yo creo que la, las soluciones pueden ser más regionales y en el caso de América Latina, pues el reto está en que los gobiernos progresistas realmente cumplan las expectativas que tenemos. Y por ejemplo, una propuesta que yo y muchos y muchas hemos hecho es la creación de un centro de, un centro de solución de controversias a nivel regional, a nivel de Latinoamérica, y que de todos los países de América Latina se retiren del CIADI. Ya me parece una, un sueño un poquito, demasiado, demasiado un sueño, ¿no? Porque antes se hablaba mucho de eso, antes, con la primera, eh, la primera corriente de países progresistas a inicios de este siglo, pues se veía como algo más factible. Ahora, pues lamentablemente la mayoría de los países, de los gobiernos progresistas parecen eh, más alejados de propuestas que se hacían a principios del siglo. Nada más. Thanks very much, Manuel. Um, I want to share another question uh, from the chat. Oh, go ahead, Karen, and then I'll go to the next question. I just want to add something brief that occurred to me as you were talking about all of this. When we talk about, think about claiming another victory, uh, which was the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Massive opposition to ISDS was one of the key reasons that one fell apart. And it looks like now, even as the US and EU are in negotiations on technology issues, nobody wants to touch ISDS. So I think that is another example. I, it was important, you know, both because reason was on our side, but also because there were such strong mobilizations around these issues. It became important topics in the public debate. And so uh, anyway, I just think it is, it has been an important theme uh, in, in many of these confrontations with free trade agreements. Thanks, Karen. Um, I want to share a question from Tovita Chao. Um, writes, governments in Europe and some others like South Korea have objected to the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act's provisions to support U.S. clean energy industries as protectionism and as counter to free trade norms, saying that this will come at a cost to their clean energy industry industries. Goals. Um, what what should we make of this? I would like to respond first, Manuel. Uh, I'd reflect that to Karen. <laughs> Karen. <laughs> It's a hard question and it's a kind of, it's an issue that's come up previously in trade agreements. Um, the US and India a few years ago sued each other over um, renewable energy programs that involve local job creation. And in both cases, um, the, the rules were deemed illegal. Now in the US, I think the programs just kept chugging along. I don't think any changes were actually made in that case. I'm not sure about in India, but it's certainly something that has come up before. Um, and in discussions on public procurement and making that green, there have been objections to that. I have not been involved in the details of this, but I would say um, that when we think about, as I was talking about with fertilizers, you know, as we think about a just transition, we are talking not only about reducing emissions, but also about creating jobs. It has to be about both. And I think the trade rules need to accommodate that. On the other hand, it's not an absolute position. It is something that needs to be negotiated under what conditions 
is it reasonable or under what conditions is it uh, just protect, protecting a particular industrial sector? I think that's something we need to, to keep talking through. But in general, I think we do have to have, uh, you know, we have to create jobs, good jobs for people in a new kind of economy. Manuel? Sí, en relación con esto, una preocupación que tenemos es el impulso que se le está dando a la, a la minería, sobre todo a los minerales críticos. Eh, sabemos que el gran impulso que le está dando la administración de Biden a, a combatir los fossil fuels, los combustibles fósiles, gas, petróleo, pero por otro lado, a expensas de, el, de, de comunidades que viven alrededor de, eh, de depósitos de los minerales críticos como litio, cobalto, etc. ¿no? Y esto se da a todo nivel, porque hay tanto preocupaciones a nivel de poblaciones nativas en Estados Unidos y Canadá, como el resto de, del mundo. ¿no? Entonces, eh, la, 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 la gran cuestión también es cómo transitar hacia una economía de energías limpias sin atropellar los derechos humanos y seguir destruyendo el medio ambiente. Y por supuesto, la solución pues, es un modelo de consumo distinto. ¿no? Eh, la solución no son los coches eléctricos, sino el transporte público, etc. ¿no? Pero, eh, digo, parece obvio lo que estoy diciendo, pero creo que es una cuestión medular. ¿no? El cambio de patrones de consumo. Y que tiene que ver con, también con el, la cuestión del, del crecimiento o el decrecimiento, ¿no? las teorías de, de crecimiento económico. Thanks, Manuel. And, um, and I, I would just say that another way that the whole matter of trade and investment has come into this debate and all of this talk now of nearshoring and friendshoring in order to control these um, supply chains around minerals and metals in particular. Um, they've put very, the US in particular, I think, has been very clear, and Canada as well. Um, I'm less sure about Europe, but has been very clear that. To be a friend, it means having a free trade agreement or having a bilateral investment agreement that would guarantee um, the investments of, of their transnational corporations. Um, in, and this is actually, I think this is coming up in Argentina right now. I'm seeing all these news pieces around this concern about, well, Argentina doesn't have a free trade agreement with the US. And so will they extra, you know, um, buy our, our lithium and other minerals and metals? And so uh, there's a lot of pressure kind of reinforcing uh, these, these, same, these same trade and investment relationships. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. And I, I want to just uh, I'm not seeing other questions at the moment, and I'd like to do another round to just ask you all generally, um, and if you'd like to respond to something else uh, that's come up, um, feel free to do that. But I'm just wondering where each of you see the most promise for building greater movement uh, to fight against um, these trade and investment rules, but also the, the imaginary around it and this kind of sense of inevitability or sense of um, that that I think in many places and many countries that it's become unquestioned uh, the need for um, this type of investment and these sorts of guarantees and stability for this investment. What do you see as um, the promise or, or things that we need to be taking into consideration to either tackle these myths or to build greater movement? Are, are there cross movement opportunities that we're not uh, taking advantage of? Or are there movements, local movements that are taking place that we should know more about? Um, kind of wide open, um, if we can maybe just go around and whoever wants to start first, please, please go ahead. Luciana? Um... A ver, lo que creo es que si algo ha tenido el movimiento global en estos últimos 20 años es que en su constitución, en los 90, los años 90, tuvo la capacidad de asociarse o incluir organizaciones dinámicas en ese momento. Estamos hablando, por ejemplo, del movimiento campesino, o sea, la, la fuerza que había tomado vía campesina con el reclamo 
por la eh, exclusión del Acuerdo de Agricultura de la eh, OMC, de WTO, eh, estamos hablando del movimiento indígena que entró, eh, por ejemplo, la, la CLOC, que es la Confederación Latinoamericana de Organizaciones del Campo, entró en la vía campesina y los reclamos indígenas estaban dentro de nuestros reclamos por una globalización no neoliberal, ¿no? era lo que nos unía. El movimiento sindical tenía una fuerza importante a fines de los 90 en los reclamos también contra los tratados de libre comercio. Hoy, 20 años después, es diferente el panorama que tenemos de movimientos sociales. Yo creo que sí, claro, que hay que incorporar los movimientos territoriales, pero también me parece que tenemos que ser inteligentes para leer el clima eh, político que hay a nivel global. Quizás de los últimos años, los movimientos más dinámicos que hemos tenido, por lo menos con claridad en América Latina, creo que en Europa también, en Estados Unidos también, eh, aunque cada país tiene sus particularidades, pero por ejemplo en América Latina, los dos movimientos más dinámicos, o, o el movimiento, sí, más dinámico en estos últimos años, ha sido el movimiento de mujeres. Entonces, ¿Significa eso que hace 20 años no estaban las mujeres reclamando? Sí, claro estaban las mujeres reclamando. Sí, claro que incorporábamos al movimiento feminista. Pero la fuerza que ha tomado el feminismo desde, desde eh, crear econo la economía feminista, por ejemplo, desde empujar alternativas eh, económicas feministas, desde pensar el, toda la economía desde una mirada eh, eh, feminista, eso implica que nosotros también tenemos que poder dialogar e incorporar ese tipo de miradas al interior de nuestros análisis cuando pensamos la agenda sobre comercio e inversiones. Y el segundo gran actor, que quizás no tanto en América Latina, pero que sin duda en el norte global se ha visto como un actor dinámico y que no puede ser separado, no puede ser desoído, es el movimiento ambiental, por una justicia ambiental. Eh, ese movimiento en América Latina no, no tiene la forma de movimiento ambiental, tiene otras formas. Ahí sí aparece como movimientos territoriales, aparece como lucha por el agua, la lucha por el, ter el territorio limpio, la lucha contra las zonas de sacrificio. Eso sí aparece en América Latina con una, una formato, un formato tal vez, me parece a mí, más territorial. Pero esos dos movimientos o sea, es, son los que nosotros estamos hoy de a poco incorporando al corazón del análisis sobre la agenda de comercio e inversiones. Si no somos capaces de dialogar con esos movimientos más dinámicos, nos vamos a quedar atrás, nos vamos a quedar como grupos de activistas eh, eh, llorando por la época de la lucha contra el ALCA, de lo lindo que era cuando, cuando enterramos el ALCA, pero hoy necesitamos poder vincular los temas en un contexto donde hace 20 años, díganme Karen y, y Manuel, que son dos pioneros de la lucha contra los tratados de libre comercio, eh, yo aprendí leyéndolos a ustedes, eh, nos, nos pasa que necesitamos que esto sea parte de nuestro análisis cotidiano, que sea parte del de el trabajo que hacemos hoy en, en parte del análisis, parte de la intervención política. En Argentina hoy tener un movimiento dinámico que no incorpore la perspectiva feminista es difícil, por ejemplo. Entonces también incluye eh, la necesidad de incorporar esta estas perspectivas, ¿no? que es una, una, una cuestión dinámica que hay que ir generando diálogos y generando eh, los espacios para, para que se puedan sumar entonces a esta, a esta lucha. I would agree, and I really, I have to say, I, I agree completely, and I really appreciate the, the new breadth of the climate justice movement, that it is something that goes well beyond environmental protection. And I think that is a starting point for a lot of changes. I would say, you know, as in my, from where I sit, I'm thinking about food systems a lot. And I also see that if we look back at the last couple of years, uh, COVID, the war, and then the crises we're already seeing coming from climate change are big disruptions. They disprove Uh, that we should be relying on a few suppliers of key commodities, and they argue for doing things differently. They expose the fragility of the system. Um, now, I mean, just as one example of early change from climate change, the Mississippi River now is dried up in certain points. 
So the U.S. cannot export some of the grains it needs to. It can't move some of these products. We'll be seeing more of these things. I would also hope that after the disruptions of the last couple of years, that we can begin to come together in person more. I love these Zoom gatherings, right? But it is not the same thing as sitting around really building relationships. That's what movements have to be about. They can be supplemented by Zoom. And I'm grateful we have this. Um, but I think we're in a new moment now. And we need to, to come together again uh, to build those alternatives, to, to think through those campaigns. OK. Yeah, I don't really love these Zoom gatherings. I mean, I really, estoy de acuerdo con Karen. Este, necesitamos estar más cerca, ¿no? Eh, y, y sentir el calor humano y sobre todo la, la articulación entre movimientos globales contra los tratados de libre comercio, etcétera, y las luchas locales. Este suena un poco a cliché, pero creo que tanto Jen como yo nos nutrimos mucho y nos seguiremos nutriendo y tanta gente más de la batalla que se dio en El Salvador para vencer a las empresas mineras que demandaron al país por cientos de millones de dólares y cómo nos articulamos con las luchas más locales, más territoriales en defensa del agua, con la lucha global contra este sistema perverso. ¿no? Y bueno, si se me permite hacer un anuncio, este, eh, John Cabana, nuestro exdirector de IPS y Robin Broad, escribieron este libro de Water Defenders y ya está en español. Defender el agua, y perdón por el anuncio, pero pues es una historia que realmente nos llena de esperanza, de cómo un pueblo y una comunidad local logró llevar su lucha a un nivel nacional, y de lo nacional se pasó a lo internacional. Y no fue nada más la solidaridad internacional hacia ellos, hacia los salvadoreños, sino toda la inspiración que ellos y ellas nos dieron a nivel internacional, ¿no? Entonces es una cosa de solidaridad de dos vías. Y también la importancia que tuvo que ver, lo que decía Luciana, la importancia que tiene que ver el tema de género, porque mucha de la, de la valentía a nivel de estas luchas se da, pues sí, por parte de lideresas, ¿no? Y de, y, y de, y de hay, 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 hay narraciones, es, artículos. No sé si tú, Jen, escribiste uno sobre la importancia que tuvieron que ver, este, en particular, lideresas, mujeres en, en la lucha en El Salvador por la defensa del lago y de su territorio, pero hay un artículo, ¿no? Bien. En fin, pues todos estos temas, ¿no? Que se tra trastocan la, las luchas globales con lo local, con lo, con lo, gen lo de género. Eh, yo creo que ahí está la esperanza en, en lograr conectar, conectar tantas cosas que parecen temas aparte, pero que en realidad están entremezclados. Thanks very much, Manuel and Karen and Luciana. And um, I think we're going to wrap things up here. And just a thank you to us, to the partners, um, the Institute for Policy Studies Global Just Transition Project and all of the work that John Pfeffer has done and the collaboration with the Ecosocial Pact of the South. Uh, and uh, to all of you who've, who've joined us today and who'll be listening to the recording later, and as well, very much a big, big thank you to our interpreters, Heather and Peter, without whom we cannot do this comfortably in a bilingual way. So thank you for that. And um, have a wonderful rest of your day and rest of your weekend and uh, the best of holiday season as well. Gracias a todos. Hasta luego. Un abrazo.